morning everyone. So we're going to continue our review into chapter 3 on periodicity. Uh, hopefully you've been able to access these summary notes. Remember one reminder is these summary notes here, they're good in overviewing some of the major topics in the sections, but they really don't have many uh, practice questions per se. So make sure as you finish up watching this lesson and take down some notes, being reminded of some of the concepts that you may have forgotten, make sure you go to the study guide, go to the practice questions available, try out some problems for yourself, and then just double check your answers. Uh, don't sort of trick yourself into a false sense of confidence, just, oh yeah, 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 I get how he does it, right? Just actually practice it through even if you do understand it, uh, make sure you practice enough questions so you can do it fairly quickly. So, without further ado here, this is periodicity, topic 3. We started off looking at a fellow called Dmitri Mendeleev. So in the 1800s, remember we were under the Dalton model at this point. Dalton solid sphere idea. There were probably about 50 or 60 pure elements available. And what he did was, for Mendeleev, he actually had these element cards. Basically, he played a big game of solitaire. And he actually found that by arranging uh, the table, he did increasing atomic mass because the Dalton model didn't know about protons and neutrons just yet. But nowadays, we can actually say, if you arrange things by increasing atomic number, so from smallest to biggest, there is what's called a periodic law. The patterns on the periodic table actually end up repeating. So just some more terminology here. He wasn't the only one. He was working with uh, many others from work from be before him as well, but he was the one that was credited with getting us really close to our sort of modern picture of the periodic table. The terminology here, we have the period number. So we start from row number one, row number two. We call periods going left and right. When we say across a period, we mean left to right. The period number actually indicates for you the number of shells your Bohr model would have, the energy levels, or the valence shell. Whereas the group or the family, chemicals are in the same family. They all look alike, they all behave the same. The reason for that is because they have the same number of valence electrons. So if you look at the group number, IB does like calling it column number one. All these ones here have one valence electron, column number two. IB would say transition metals are column three through 12, making the boron column here actually column number 13. Because we know from chapter two, these ones here are actually our, T, our 10D electrons. If we subtract off the 10, uh, the 13 would also be called group number three, three valence electrons all the way up to technically group 18 and eight valence electrons. Remember, our valence electrons are just the S and the Ps. Those tend to be the furthest out from the nucleus. Any d orbitals and f orbitals are a lot closer to the core. The two fundamental principles that we were dealing with uh, in explaining some of these trends here is the notion of uh, nuclear charge and effective nuclear charge. The nuclear charge, once we sort of fast forward a little bit for Bohr model, we knew that the nucleus was made out of positives. There's a bunch of protons. That's what makes you this element. Depending on how many positives are in the core, that's actually going to control how many electrons actually get attracted to the neighbor. But in this case here, especially if I were electron on the outer shell, I'm supposed to be attracted to every single one of these protons in the core, but because there are electrons with a negative charge, they sort of block out and they sort of screen out my visibility of the proton. Uh, my student teacher used to use the analogy, imagine the nucleus is a celebrity, a celebrity walks into the room, everyone flocks around the celebrity, you may have be two rows out from the celebrity, you can sort of see the celebrity, but you're sort of blocked out and screened, shielded from the full uh, positive attraction from the nucleus or from the celebrity. So what we get is something called a Z-effective. This is sort of a hand-wavy math here. What we're going to do is Z-effective, it's supposed to be the real number of protons. Every proton has a full positive one, but I have to minus off any number of electrons that are inner. Any ones that are closer than me, that could be electrons that are on an inner shell. Let's say two electrons on the first shell, or even those d orbitals or f orbitals that we said are inner, we would need to subtract those as well. Those don't count as valence, and those would actually block out some of the nucleus's charge. We had this idea of effective nuclear charge. The other one here is once we learn effective nuclear charge, that indicated to us in our Coulomb formula here something about the Z effective, something about how much leftover positive and negative actually exists. For Coulomb, it actually gives us a relationship. We see this uh, phenomenon again and again. The force is actually proportional to the charge. So for example, as the charges go up, more protons, more electrons, the force of attraction will go up as well. And this is actually inversely related to the radius. It's inversely related to the separation distance. When things are close together, they feel a stronger attraction or stronger repulsion, depending on their signs. But when things are far away, they actually don't see each other as well. In fact, charges would have to be at infinity before they 
kind of completely don't know each other present, um, but we typically are just looking at the radius of the atom itself. These are the two main properties. These are what you're going to bank on in terms of your explanations. So in some sense here, let's say going across, what happens is that effective? Well, we know with our periodic law, every time you go to the right, you pick up another proton. The more protons you have, the higher the z-effective is going to be, the stronger the force. That means the more positive center will end up pulling in elements that have the same number of shells, will pull it in closer and closer to the nucleus. Because the z-effective increases, you can just use that terminology, we can rationalize here then the radius actually decreases. The same nuclei is actually able to actually pull shells in tighter. We can try to use the z-effective argument for up and down as well. It sort of fails because if you try to do z-effective, hydrogen is z-effective of plus one, lithium is plus one, this uh, sodium is plus one. Remember, this is not the charge of the element itself. This is just this funny math. The total number of protons minus off-screen shells. In fact, this uh, z-effective actually corresponds to row number as well. The z-effective for boron's column, these are all plus three. Noble gases have a z-effective of plus eight. Again, not the real charge, but this is the leftover, how much of that celebrity, how much of the positive do I still see from the core. So the z-effective actually stays fairly similar. This actually helps out because you might compare, well, hydrogen only has one proton, suddenly lithium has three. Of course, lithium attracts more, but you also need to factor that in. Well, lithium also has the fact that lithium actually has two shells, and it's actually the number of shells that actually becomes more important. I would actually emphasize here, even though the z-effective doesn't really change going downwards, we can still comment the radius here increases, and it's because of more shells. Remember, throughout this section, they're going to always ask you to do explaining style questions. Your explanations cannot be, oh, I've just memorized. This side is smaller atoms. This side is higher electron affinity. You need to come back to properties like, what do you know about the size? How do you know the sizes like that? Okay. Also, a note, when you see examples that say state and explain, state isn't just, oh, this one's bigger than this one. What you're going to actually say is actually go to your data booklet. When it's a state, it actually means just look up the numbers and actually cite the numbers. Also in your explanations, let's say I was, uh, let's just do an example. Uh, let's say we're comparing magnesium, which is sitting here. Let's compare it to chlorine. I might ask you, well, which one has a larger radius? When you're wording it in sort of your phrasing here, magnesium is bigger than chlorine because throughout this chapter, I'm going to try to get you to avoid the term it because I don't really know which element you're talking about when you write it that way. I think Englishly speaking, it refers to the closest element which is probably not the one that you were talking about. I would rather you just say magnesium is bigger, larger radius, because magnesium, reiterate that element here, magnesium has smaller ZEF. They used to call that effective ENC as well, effective nuclear charge. As long as you use that vocabulary, that's enough justification. So in this case here, I've done an explanation. If it did say state and explain, I go to my data booklet values. I think my atomic radii are in table number nine. I'd actually cite magnesium is this many picometer. So I was just saying uh, the chlorine is this many uh, picometers here, and I can actually cite the values themselves. Okay, so that's how we deal with our explanations. Um, we're going to look at these periodic trends. Careful, these periodic trends are all physical in nature. This is talking about uh, the properties that don't depend on the valence electrons and all that. These are just some uh, uh, characteristics that we can just uh, uh, talk about uh, for these elements here. So starting off here, we have atomic radius. We already talked about the size changing. Usually it's easier if you just track, let's say radius decreases, I would just point it in one direction. Basically metals tend to be the very largest ones. As you lose that met, uh, metallic character and go to the non-metals, we're gonna typically um, end up getting smaller radius. So I have uh, the generalizations as well as the explanations, especially when you take a look at ionic radius. For ionic radius, let's take lithium as an example. When lithium becomes a plus one charge, it's like going from lithium having two shells and suddenly lithium is now down just to one shell. Because it's lost a shell, in general, cations tend to be smaller than the atoms. There's either less electron repulsion or even it could have lost a shell. Depending on how many electrons it took before you lost a shell, you can figure out uh, sort of what group this might be in. Whereas an anion is sort of the opposite. When an anion gets reduced and it picks up the electrons, we're still the very same element. Fluorine has basically two shells almost full. Once you add the added electron, we're still fluorine. But that added electron, even though it's added to the next lowest energy spot, encounters more electron repulsion, 
but added repulsion would tend to mean now bigger. That trend there on radius becomes really important in explaining the following trends. For ionization energy, make sure in your technical definition, I noticed that I missed it here, you need to mention here it's the minimum energy. If you have an infinite amount of energy, of course all electrons are going to come off. But in this case here, it's the least energy that you can still have. Uh, in terms of ionizing here, you come in with a pair of tweezers, you grab that first electron that you see, and you try to pull it off, not just for a single atom, because that's a really uh, minimal amount of energy, you're going to line up an Avogadro number of atoms, and you're going to pull off this electron, off every single one of this Avogadro number. So in your technical definition, you do need to say minimum, you do need to refer to the electrons being removed, but in this case here, it's for a whole mole, which is why units are usually going to be kilojoules per mole in this section here, and also uh, it has to be at gaseous state. For solids and liquids, they may have a different hold on the electrons. It's a little bit hard to... Um, uh, experiment with them, so I do want them to start off actually as a gas. Make sure you know these ones here. These are called representative equations. Remember, equation doesn't necessarily mean that it is a uh, math equation or formulas. It just means a balance equation. So you take uh, this metal here. Here's really picky. They do need to have the gas. Every time you come in for a new electron, you're actually ionizing it more. So this is called your first uh, ionization energy. If you come back a second time, generally successive ionizations, when you come back again, it gets harder and harder because the thing is becoming more and more positive. The remaining electrons are, uh, are experiencing less electron repulsion, so it gets harder and harder, and let alone you may even lose a shell. Remember, the second ionization energy, even though the number itself might be bigger, the second is just for that second electron. It's not cumulative, it's not accumulative or anything like that. It is just for one electron at a time. Uh, basically, there's an opposite relationship between ionization and radius. For your periodic table, you had that on the top table, but because your radius here starts shrinking, based on Coulomb, if I'm a larger atom, it should be easier to remove. Low ionization energy for something that's big, whereas something that's tiny, trying to remove that very same electron, a lot closer to the core, is going to be really hard to remove. So ionization energy, if you want to track this, ionization energy and radii are sort of opposite of each other, they're inversely related. Again, your reasoning should come down to something about the size. I know this one here is smaller radius, so therefore the ionization energy is higher. There are a few exceptions, however. These two showed up in chapter two. If you look at nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as uh, beryllium and boron, okay, based on this atomic trend, I would have imagined for nitrogen, nitrogen should have been a big atom, oxygen should have been a tinier one, it should be harder to remove oxygen. And yet they're going to tell you oxygen actually has a lower ionization energy than nitrogen. Oxygen's electron is actually easier to remove. If you think back to your chapter 2, the reason for that here is nitrogen by itself is a 2p3. Oxygen here is actually a 2p4. For oxygen, although the size here might actually be smaller, in this case here, if I happen to ionize, if I pull off this one electron, I end up minimizing the repulsion. These two electrons hate each other. So we end up minimizing these uh, electron repulsion. The nitrogen is enjoying what's called half-fill stability. Even though it's not enough to actually cause an exception, like promote any S electrons up, having this half-filled shell here actually does stabilize the nitrogen. So I'm going to still keep this half-fill stability. I really don't want to lose this electron. Not impossible, because I'm enjoying the stability. In a similar fashion, the other exception was between beryllium and boron, or aluminum and magnesium, just right underneath it. Basically, for beryllium, it would have an S2 electron, whereas a boron has an S2 and a P1. And we're just going to look qualitatively here. Based on our orbital diagrams, our Ps are farther out from the core than Ss. So we can just conclude here, Ps are easier to remove than S. Okay. So P easier than S. So those two are exceptions. They really like asking you those two questions. We then did a few other uh, physical trends here, electron activity. Make sure in your definition, most people remember electron activity as this tug of war. That is true. But you have to mention here, the tug of war has to be tug of war in bonds. Noble gases are typically not given um, these electron activity values because noble gases pretty much keep to themselves. They don't form any bonds, so there's no reason in giving them an actual EN number. Electron activity is also a Coulomb attraction, kq over r squared. We want our charges to be big, and we want our radius to be small. 
for us to be at the strongest attraction, not only for the electrons that are around myself already, but also when I do form that bond, I actually want to see how hungry I am for those electrons there. Remember this EN here is actually the uh, deciding factor whether we're ionic or covalent. In the definition it says covalent, but when the difference gets to be more than that 1.8 value, basically the non-metal is pulling so hard, it's the bully, and it completely steals the electron which otherwise would have been shared. In that case there, the full electron gets transferred and suddenly we're an ionic bond. In chapter 4, we came back and we looked at polar covalent bonds and dipoles and all that. That was sort of the in-between between, between uh, the tug-of-war strengths. So that's EN. We have EA here, which is uh, electron affinity. This one here you can think of is the opposite of IE. So ionization energy, you came in with a pair of tweezers, you wanted to remove the electron, figure out how difficult it is for you to become a positive charge. This time I have electrons off at infinity, and I'm imagining giving these electrons to the atoms. Metal or non-metal, I know metals generally don't want to have negative charges, uh, but in this case here, we're going to find Again, it's a lesser of two evils kind of example. My metals tend to be a very large radius. It doesn't necessarily want to become negative one, but instead of this electron loss at infinity doing who knows what, the metal would say, fine, by gaining that electron here, at least I can stabilize it by a little bit. All your first uh, electron affinities are going to be exothermic. All of them are going to end up releasing energy. By releasing energy, I'm now at a lower energy, so I'm actually going to be more stable. So even metals, which are large, they're going to like sort of begrudgingly grab this electron, whereas non-metals, which typically they use X, and it's a smaller atom, these guys here are closer to a noble gas configuration. That's one other reason, but definitely those electrons are a lot closer to the core. There's your reason. Because you have it closer to the core, you have more stability. You can release off more energy. Just a comment on numbers then. Uh, let's say I have a number. I think lithium is negative 60 for electron affinity. Chlorine is some negative, I think it's 348, if I remember top of my head here. We're just going to assume that we know that first uh, electron affinities are going to be negative. So I'm not going to worry about uh, the negatives. I'm just going to comment on the size, the magnitude, the absolute value. This one here releases 60. This is less exothermic. So we say that it's lower EA. It's not as affinite, it's not as liking for those electrons as, say, this one here, a higher EA. It's ending up releasing off more energy, even though in math class, negative 348 is actually a tinier number. So that one there is electron affinity. Finally, we come to this uh, melting point trend. The takeaway from this one here you want to see is the melting point trend is the worst. Melting point is this temperature that you need to change a solid into a liquid. This is going to really depend on how things are bonded together. If things are attached really strongly, you're going to need to have even hotter temperatures to actually melt. So that's a nice conclusion here. You will have higher melting points if there are stronger intermolecular forces, IMF. Uh, in some cases here, let's say for your metallic bonding here, these get stronger as the radius shrink because we're thinking kq for r squared. So these get stronger when I have bigger charges, more protons, and also smaller radius. So for the metallic bonding case, Metallic bonding increases towards the middle. On the opposite side here, we have our non-metals. The melting point generally also increases going downwards, but that's for a totally different reason. These ones for our non-metals, they do London forces. Remember, the strange part here is I'm not actually trying to break apart bonds. I'm not actually destroying, let's say, covalent bond and fluorine. What I'm just trying to do is break those really weak uh, instantaneous uh, temporary dipole relationships, those really weak background attractions for positive and negatives. I'm just trying to heat it up enough that these ones here can actually shake hard enough to actually separate. For London forces to get stronger, they get stronger with more charges, uh, stronger with more charges, and the best way to track how do you know stronger with more charges, we actually look for a bigger molar mass. The larger the molar mass, the more charges that you have, the more background attractions, even if, let's say iodine, iodine here is a much larger molecule. It's having to reach out much, much farther to attract other London forces, but iodine, every single iodine center has way more positives, which also means it has way more negatives, it has way more background interactions, which actually makes iodine actually a solid under our regular exposure of it. In the middle, we have our best of both worlds. Uh, we call these guys here a covalent network. These ones here are like your diamond. These have the... Uh, the lattice structure, like an ionic compound, but they have the strength of a covalent bond. If you try to break, let's say, diamond, we'll see the structure again in chapter 4, 
But if you try to break diamond again, not only are there really strong covalent bonds already, I'm having to break every single one of these bonds. There's no plane of symmetry or anything like that. It's really, really hard to break up. So these ones here will generally have the highest melting point. I can throw in boiling point as well because that's a measure of a physical change uh, of uh, physical trend. So those ones there, we're dealing with physical properties. Make sure you can do those state and explain kind of questions. Next part here is on chemical properties. We did a few different groups just uh, because the trends here are a little bit nicer. We started off with things that were fairly inert, inert meaning they don't really react. The reason why they are inert or they don't react is because something about having a full shell makes them stable. So starting from helium and the other noble gases, which end off with a P6 kind of notation, they already have a full shell. There's no reason for them to actually want to gain extra electrons. So in terms of the charges, they're going to be a zero. They're monatomic, so they don't bond with things, not giving electron activities. Uh, and they have very high ionization energies because they're the smallest atoms on the row. In contrast, if we look at the two columns that are beside, quote unquote, okay, the alkali metals here, this alkali metal column would have actually been right beside the noble gases. They're just one away from noble gas. In this case here, alkali metals, group one, they all have one valence electron. They have a valence of one as well. They turn out to be very soft. You can cut them with a butter knife. These ones here generally are the largest atoms on the row, even getting bigger as you go downwards. So if I'm trying to react by losing an electron, relatively speaking on every row, uh, let's say lithium, it's really easy to lose versus a neon. But even as I go down these alkali metals, I'm actually getting even easier to uh, remove electrons, so it's actually increasing reactivity. They already were reactive to begin with, but even more reactive because we can't collect enough francium. Usually they just say cesium is the most reactive alkali metal, but generally the biggest because these want to react by ionization energy. We're going to have lower and lower ionization energy. You give it a bump and the electrons come right off. For the other side here, we actually have electron affinity. Electron affinity for your halogens. Your halogens, you can see a little bit better. They are right beside. They're one short of having that full shell stability. That's going to be one important feature for them gaining electrons. That's why they have such an exothermic electron affinity. But in this case here, for your nonmetals, they typically are the smaller atoms on the row. They have a higher Z effective, which means that when they have electrons and given the opportunity to share electrons or gain electrons, they can stabilize those electrons well. They can steal electrons from the... Um, from the metals very well as well. So in this case, by trying to react by gaining electrons, the reactivity for halogens actually increases going upwards. The tinier that I am, it's increasing reactivity. So the most vigorous reaction will be between the biggest metal, say cesium or francium, with fluorine. I'm not going to go into that helium column because that one there is a noble gas, not really react. Remember in this section here, it's sort of downside. You do need to memorize some equations. Some of them are easily predicted just based on our topic 11 kind of stuff. And some of them you just need to do route memory. Not the end of the world if you can't memorize them because it doesn't show up very often. But it is fair game for them to actually quote for this reactant and this reactant, what's the product going to be. So here are some reactions I just want to uh, summarize for you. Alkali metals, make sure you know it's oxidation. That one there is just a, essentially a synthesis reaction. Uh, they form alkali solutions or basic solutions when they react with water. I think of water as ho. So if I have a metal, it's going to end up single replacing. The metal tries to replace the H part of it and then ending up producing the metal with the hydroxide. This is now soluble, so it ends up making a basic solution. This reaction here is between alkalis and halogens. Also, you can predict that with uh, just synthesis reaction. The more important one here is your halogens can actually swap places with each other. They're going to be accompanied with a color change because the halogens themselves typically have a color of their own. Chlorine is a pale yellow greeny gas. Bromine is like a reddish uh, brownish uh, liquid. And in this case here, let's say the reaction occurs that we start off with a greeny or yellowy gas. And because the reaction actually happens, we end up producing just pure uh, bromine. And suddenly we're going to get a reddish liquid come off of it. We're going to get a color change as an indication that the reaction has actually occurred. For this one here, we want to look at the activity series, or better yet, we look at electron activity. I know the most reactive one will be the smallest one. So fluorine is going to be more active than chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So if ever we have a reaction where one of these higher activity ones, one of these ones here that are the higher activity is given by more electronegative or more electron affinity, whenever these ones here are by themselves right now, 
If they fight against another halogen in solution, they can kick off any one lower than it, but it does not happen the other way around. Sometimes they use the term which equation occurs readily. Readily just means which one happens, where we have the more active kicks off the less active. Sometimes on a multiple choice, for a halide reaction, they might give you four solids and ask you which one is colored. Uh, the colored reason is different for this one, but just memorize for yourself, a silver halide is colored. You don't need to be able to quote the color, but you just need to quote that these ones here are colored. If given the option, white is not a color, okay, but um, if, if that's the only choice, then choose that one. So to finish off chapter 3 here, we did a section on oxides. So oxides, we had metal oxides and non-metal oxides. We started off just looking at metal oxides, so from the uh, metal side combining with ox oxygen. Metal oxides, I just want you to remember metal oxides are basic. They tend to produce hydroxides. Whereas non-metal oxides, we get more covalent sharing, we get more variety in it. When they react with the water, because the polyatomic grouping is covalently bonded, when they react with water, they actually do some fancy synthesis. They end up creating compounds that have H in them. So we see non-metals or covalent things typically produce acidic solutions. So one side's basic, one side's acidic. We use this term here, amphoteric, as this one here could be acidic or base. It's going to choose one or the other depending on what else is in solution. So again, a few other equations for you to memorize. Make sure you know sodium oxide in water, magnesium oxide, these non-metal reactions. When we get to the middle, when it sort of crosses over, we knew our metals were basic oxides, our non-metals were acidic oxides, our amphoteric ones are sort of in the middle when we transition over. Aluminum oxide is the one example of the thing that could be acid or base. In this example here, this aluminum oxide is reacting with a base that makes aluminum an acid. Whereas over here, when aluminum oxide is in the presence of stronger acid, it's going to then act as a base. So make sure you know those two reactions as well. Right. This is where we got the notion of oxidation state first introduced. Remember, when you do oxidation state, let's say I have Cl2O as uh, O7 as an example. In this case here, I know oxygen is usually an oxidation state of negative 2. 7 of them amounts to negative 14. 2 of whatever chlorine has has to cancel 14. Chlorine has an oxidation state of plus 7. You have to have the sign first before the number. They write down on the mark scheme, don't award marks if they put 7 plus. So in general, I tell people, always do sign first on the number. Most times it doesn't matter. In the case of oxidation number or oxidation state, when it does matter, you already have it memorized. Uh, silicon dioxide turns out not to be very soluble, but we find that when we uh, force it into really strong base solution, it can react. So in this case here, we just conclude silicon oxide is very weakly acidic. We have a general trend here of some of the properties. Uh, for conductivity, we need to have charges that can move around. These ones here will dissociate into ions like sodium plus, magnesium plus. These ones here just synthesize. They don't produce ions at all, so the conductivity drops as you go across. Let's end off with our transition metal section here. Right, so this is the higher level stuff here. We're going to look at uh, the D block metals. Careful, the definition is actually fairly uh, specific. To be a transition metal, you don't just have to have D electrons. You have to make sure, I actually didn't write it down here, you have to make sure you have a stable ion with an incomplete D shell. Okay. So for example, let's take zinc. Okay, give you a relative placement here. Zinc is sitting here. Zinc's configuration is actually argon 4s2 3d10. I don't just look at this and say, oh, you have a D electron. Oh, suddenly you're a transition metal. In fact, I look at the charges, the ions, Zn plus 2. I'm going to lose the S electrons first. Unfortunately, my D orbitals are completely filled. Zinc actually doesn't count as a transition metal. So I'm going to exclude group 12 and zinc and everything underneath it. For the longest time, we had excluded scandium's column as well. I would have lost all my D electrons. Uh, within the last 10, 20 years or so, we actually found scandium can actually be a plus 3. Uh, uh, sorry, a plus 2 as well. Scandium by itself would have been argon, 4s2, 3d1. If it was a plus 3, I had lost all the electrons. I don't fit this definition. But being a plus 2 instead, at least I can still be a 3d1. I follow that configuration there. Why are they so particular is because the ions typically have a very special property. We'll see in number three. But let's just go on from there here. These transition metals, when they say state properties of transition metals, you don't just want to go to the generic, oh, they're solids at room temperature, they're shiny, they're conductive, malleable ductile. You want to quote one of these four that we'll see. One feature is that they're multivalent. 
sometimes IB reverts us here as variable oxidation state or oxidation number. The reason for that is the S and the D happen to be very close in energy. So although by the time the energy levels have split, the S actually ends up lower than the uh, D, we fill up the S's first, then we start filling up the D's. If I'm on an energy level diagram, I actually realize that the difference between 4S and 3D is actually really close. That means it's not that hard to actually promote one of these electrons up. We saw that exception for chromium. Chromium would have been a D4. It prefers to have that half foot stability. For chromium, I promote, I pay a little bit to actually move that electron up. Chromium is actually going to be that 4S1, 3D5, whereas copper, it would have been 4S2, 3D9, and in a similar fashion, because they're so close in energy, this S electron just gets promoted up one. So that's a variable oxidation state. For magnetic, we have two types of magnetism. We have two reasons for it as well. Diamagnetic is things that most things have. It's the weaker of the two. It is a repulsion, and it's because you have paired electrons. Any configurations that show any pairing, you can just cite diamagnetic. The second that you have an unpaired electron in any one of the orbitals, even one unpaired electron dominates over any number of paired electrons. And having unpaired electrons actually is the stronger force. It's actually an attraction. In chapter 4, we end up seeing the paramagnetism of oxygen. We saw when we poured liquid oxygen between a magnet, it was actually sticking to the poles of the magnet. It was paramagnetic because of the unpaired electron. You'll actually get more paramagnetic the more uh, unpaired electrons that you get. So if I go across the periodic table, D1 is already um, uh, unpaired electrons, so it's paramagnetic. As I go D2, D3, D4, that paramagnetism just uh, interferes with how it constructively builds up on itself and it gets stronger and stronger. But as I start getting to D6, D7, I start losing unpaired electrons, I start losing my paramagnetism. Uh, this uh, part three and part four here are the most interesting property for transition metals. Uh, all metals would do this, but transition metals in specific here. For our transition metals, metals typically have positive charges. We can have what are called ligands. Ligands are species. You want to be fairly general with this word here. Don't just say it's just ions or just neutral molecules. So it's a chemical that can do this behavior. They have lone pairs. They have electrons that are currently not used for bonding. And what they can do is they can coordinate bond. That's the new name for a dative bond. They can coordinate bond. They can donate both of the electrons to help to stabilize the N+. In our grade 12 course, we're going to call this one here a Lewis base. A Lewis base is an electron pair transfer. And this one here is the Lewis acid uh, as the electron pair um, uh, receptor. Most covalent bonds here are usually... When a bond forms with two electrons apiece, usually a covalent bond has both people contribute one, whereas in this very special case, it's called a coordinate bond because both electrons actually come from one neighbor. So that's a coordinate bond there. Once the coordinate bond forms, however, it looks like any old covalent bond, it's hard to predict which one is actually uh, the coordinate bond. In uh, IB, we're just going to do the most common geometry, which is a coordination number of six. Basically, this metal gets surrounded left, right, front, back, and up, down. That's going to give you an octahedral splitting. Uh, denticity is how many bytes the ligand can actually take out of it. Most of them are monodentate. However, on table, I believe it's 16, you have some bidentate ones. It's going to usually be a larger element, let's say ethylene diamine. Uh, this one here actually has two sides to it. The amine grouping can actually bite twice. So that one would be a bidentate. It can actually be a claw around the metal, and we refer to that as a chelating ligand. When you form a chelate, you actually are sort of crabbing around this metal. We're still going to use the octahedral geometry, though. Okay. So that's just a little bit of background on ligands. And then the last thing here is we're going to look at, especially these transition metal ions in solution, I'm not looking at the transition metal color itself. I'm not looking at, oh, it's shiny or it's uh, silvery, reflective, and all that. I'm looking at the metal's color when it's in solution. We've dealt with solutions like, let's say, copper sulfate. So I know Cu as a metal is sort of like a bronzish solid. I'm not talking about that color. I'm talking about when it becomes copper sulfate, this solution here actually appears blue. It's actually a colored ion. They really like asking this question here, explain why transition metal ions are colored. Here are some features that you must include. In this case here, you need to identify for me what the transition metal is. In this case here, I have Cu plus 2. It's a good idea to just write the configuration. Remember, copper by itself would have been the exception. It would have looked like this at first, 
just plain old copper would have already promoted its S electron up. It would have been 4s1, 3d10. And then what we're going to do is having lost a plus 2, I pull off any p's first, then s, then d, then f. I don't have my p's yet. I pull off one of the s, make it plus 1. Phew, I end up making that unpaired electron for the ion. It's a stable ion, and that fits me in the transition metal definition. At first, all our d electrons are supposed to be degenerate. They're supposed to be equal energy. It should be equally good sitting in any one of these shells here. But what we're going to do is we're going to, upon because this is positive, upon ligands coming and trying to coordinate bond and surrounding this metal, because there's going to be repulsion between the electrons that the ligand is donating and the d electrons that the transition metal has, that repulsion is going to cause all five d orbitals. So let's say uh, repulsion from ligand, specify here, causes all five d orbitals, every one of those rooms, to go up in energy. It's not just some of them. It's not just splitting from there. But we're going to find that two of them are extra bad, just based on the shape of them. Most of the d orbitals here are butterfly shaped. The ligand can sort of squeak its way in along the axes. Whereas we have two d orbitals, one of them unfortunately happens to be exactly aligned with the axes. The ligands are sort of fighting head to head. There's going to be extra repulsion, although all five went up. Two of them are going to be extra bad as compared to three. This splitting of two and three is based on octahedral geometry. If the ligands came in at a different angle, let's say uh, planar angles or uh, like, a, like a tetrahedral kind of angle, the splitting might be different. What we are going to do in IB is we're just going to do octahedral splitting three down and two up. And what we're going to do when we do our Hunt's rule, once we have our D9, I'm going to fill in single, single, single. D4 would actually start pairing, pairing, pairing. I'm going to fill in the top, uh, D7, D8, D9. What you're going to be looking for is one other spot. It okay? doesn't matter how many, you just need to have at least one. And here's the last little bit of it. We're going to shine in light energy, which is our whole Roy G Biv. Our Roy G Biv here contains all the colors. There's going to be one unique color, delta E, and slight sort of wavelengths around that color there. There's going to be one color that gets sucked away because this electron here gets promoted between the lower set of d orbitals and the higher set of d orbitals. Here's where that color wheel came in very handy. We have our Roy G Biv. Right? The reason why our copper solution looks blue is not because we absorb blue. It's actually the opposite. We absorb something like red E or orange in wavelength, and what we end up seeing is the complement. So as you're describing this, you have to make sure you note, as long as there's room on that top shell, uh, during uh, d orbital, Let's call it internal promotion, because it's just jumping from one set of d orbitals, the lower set to the higher set. One color is absorbed. One color is removed from the white light spectrum. In this case here, it's like a reddy, orangey wavelength. And what we end up transmitting or kind of reflecting through is our complementary color. So you have to mention here, it's actually the complement that's actually shining through. In this case here, because we're focusing on absorption, I try to avoid the term emission, because emission sort of sounds like high shells falling downwards, I'm actually emitting this color. I prefer using the language of transmitting. So complementary color is transmitted, it's the opposite color on the color wheel. You might absorb so high of a color, right? This energy gap, we'll talk about the factors in a second, but as this gap here gets bigger, you might absorb violet and show yellow. You might start even absorbing like red again and actually showing green again. That's why we do call it a wheel. They really like asking this question as well, not only explaining why these transition metal ions are colored, they also want to know what the color depends on. So pretty much the color was depending on the splitting, it's depending on how big the delta E is, which just so happened to correspond to visible. Anything that you can do to change the splitting, you're going to be changing the color. The splitting was because the ligand was forcing its electrons onto the metal, in a way, it's trying to stabilize the metal because the metal is positive, but unfortunately, because the electron-electron repulsion, those negative repelling features here, it's going to cause all the shells to go higher. I can change the metal. I can have an element that has more protons. I can change my charge. I can go from iron 2 to iron 3. The more charged I am, I end up pulling my ligands tighter. That's going to cause additional splitting. 
For the ligand itself, I can change the coordination number, although we're going to use 6 as our most common geometry. If I'm only bit with 4, if my ligand can bite more than once, the denticity, if the geometry is different, that would also impact how this ends up splitting, and as well as how uh, the color that gets absorbed. Uh, for your ligands, you have this ordering of charge density. This is on section uh, 15, I believe it is. Uh, for monodentate ligands, even though iodide, let's say, iodide actually has four lone pairs. Potentially, it can coordinate bond four times, but by the time, based on your geometry, by the time the ligand has actually bit the metal on one side, unfortunately, the other orbitals are pointed the wrong way. So it can't wrap around again. That's why it's monodentate. Iodide is five shells big, so it's a fairly large uh, uh, radius. Because of a very large radius, the charge density is not as high. Let's compare that to, let's say, fluoride. Fluoride is in a very similar fashion, has those eight electrons, but fluorine is only on row number two. Having two electrons in a 2p orbital instead of a 5p orbital is going to be much more electron rich. When this fluorine forces itself onto a ligand, there's going to be a lot more repulsion. And what we see chemically is um, things that are higher on the list, they're called stronger field ligands. They have no trouble kicking off anything that's weaker. Although these reactions here typically are more equilibrium reactions, they don't really go 100%. Sometimes you might get the odd weaker ligand replace a stronger ligand, but that has to do more with actual proportions, actual concentrations inside. We did a few labs actually that uh, use this sort of phenomenon. I can send in whatever colors of light that I want. I can figure out based on my sample, say it is a blue solution, I can figure out well, how much red wavelength did I start off sending in, how much of it actually manages to get out, and I can actually track either the absorbance or the transmittance, and we were able to use that uh, using our spectrophotometry kind of technique. Hopefully that recaps with you uh, a lot of the main concepts for transition metals. The one last one that they end off with here, which we'll end off as well, is transition metals typically catalyze reactions. Catalysts are separated between heterogeneous and homogeneous. Catalysts only speed up things. If you want something that slows down things, it's called an inhibitor. Inhibitor would actually slow things down. But for transition metals, because they speed things up, they actually provide an alternate pathway that's easier. They provide a detour to get from the same start and same finish. Some of them are heterogeneous. They're in different states. I would memorize these equations here. The Haber process here uses iron as a catalyst. A uh, catalytic converter here in a car, it takes really dangerous gases like carbon monoxide, nitrogen monoxides, puts them into a little bit more stable forms. We use palladium and platinum as a catalyst. Even inside our blood, hemoglobin here is our oxygen carrier. Hemoglobin is a catalyst. It allows the red blood cell to actually absorb oxygen and then also subsequently release it when the blood cells get around to the muscles. So uh, hopefully that's a nice recap of periodicity for you. If you have any questions, do let me know. Thanks, guys.